Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Leadership Now with me, Dan Pontifract. Uh, today is a very, very special day for me. Tom Peters in the house, co-author, of course, of In Search of Excellence, the book that changed the way the world does business and is often tagged as the best business book ever. 20 books and 40 years later, Tom is still at the forefront of the, quote, management guru industry. He single-handedly invented what's new. Well, what's new? A lot. As CNN said, while most business gurus milk the same mantra for all it's worth, the one-man brand called Tom Peters is still reinventing himself. I agree. His most recent effort with co-author Nancy Green is Tom Peters' Compact Guide to Excellence. Idea Press Publishing in November of 2022, his tireless focus has and will continue to be always on putting people first and developing leaders who stay in intimate touch with the frontliners who actually do the real work. I was in the audience in London, November 2017, when Tom received the Thinkers 50 Lifetime Achievement Award. We even got a selfie together. And tickle me pink with glee, Tom. You endorsed my first book called Flat Army with one word, superb, with, of course, your customary exclamation mark, which I think is trademarked. Tom, so yes, great to have you here. I assure uh, you, even when you say it, it's trademarked. <laughs> See, someone's making money off of this one, and that's you yeah. on the exclamations. I think, um, you know, the former president of the U.S., Donald Trump, had a lot of your exclamation marks that he shouldn't have oh. used. Don't let's uh let, let's I want to bring up first uh two words that you have used for so long in your career and I love them together because uh they're not ironical and it's not an oxymoron it's something you wholeheartedly believe in and that's something called extreme humanism. So what is it first of all Tom and what can we learn from those two words packed together? Well, one practical reason for putting the two words together is it appears sometimes that the de facto assumption is as AI moves faster and faster and farther and farther and deeper and deeper, you know, what the hell role is left for people. And, you know, and my argument is this thing I'm calling extreme humanism is more important than ever. You know, you take this most recent book and I don't think we got you a copy and I'm not holding it up to advertise it, but it's small, it's undersized. Yeah. And the book is co-written with Nancy Green. It should be Nancy Green co-written with me. She is one of the top designers in the world on everybody's list. And I don't know how the hell I was lucky enough to get hooked up with her. But the point is the, the book is the feel and taste and touch and smell as much as it is the words that are inside. And I think that was a lot of the magic of, of Steve Jobs. You know, the answer was he didn't, he didn't invent some new version of an electron, but he created this magical device that was, you know, a thousand miles from anything that had existed before. And so the extreme humanism, you know, says people first, people first more than ever. Uh, and, you know, and, and that's reflected in the products and services that we offer. So, Tom, picking up on that, when we say people first, um, it dawned on me, given I look at data being a bit of a HR people and culture wonk all day, and the data suggests that maybe we're not putting people first. So what's getting in the way of extreme humanism? So you know the answer <laughs> to that as well as I do, and neither of us knows what the answer is. Uh, you know, my joke line has been that if you want that I have many, many technical degrees, but if you want to understand everything that I have written, you have to show me a signed graduation certificate from the third grade, meaning age eight. It ain't very intellectual. Uh, and I mean, part of it is is I don't know. I wrote an FT piece last year and said it would help if we closed all the business schools down. Mm. And I at least half meant it. Uh, people first should be natural. It's not. 
uh, in the business school sense of the word, we put finance first, we put marketing first, we put manipulation of data first, and just the plain old people thing never quite makes it to the top of the pile. Uh, I mean, you've asked, you know, we obviously we could spend the next three hours or three weeks on that specific question. And I wish I had an answer. And in fact, I'm quite depressed at the moment because I was thinking 20 books, 2,700 speeches. And yet I still read that only 20% of people are engaged by their work and 80% aren't. And as far as I'm concerned, not to put you in the same way, man, did I F up some how if that number is still the case. Uh, you know, I mean, I think I know how to fix it in your 11 person department or 11 person firm. I'm not sure when it gets to be 110,000, mm -hmm. but the Fortune 500, et cetera, F FTSE 100 are not that significant to the economy in actual fact, certainly in job creation. You know, there's this, I just wrote a recent paper and it started off with this wonderful little experiment. It was well measured by the, by the social psychologist. Um, Tom Peters is teaching a seventh grade history class. Uh, the class starts in about 15 minutes and Tom goes to the doorway and as each of the kids come in, he says, good morning, Don. Good morning, Jane. You know, really good to see you. I'm glad to see Nicole that that cough seems a little bit better than it was a couple of days ago. And no long conversation, just a nod, a thank you, a smile. And with that in place, the hard nose numbers show uh, that behavioral incidents drop by about 20%. Academic engagement goes up by 25%. Just by that little teeny weeny humanizing of a simple interaction. And, you know, that's the, that's, why is it, why the hell haven't I gotten anywhere on that? Why have you and I pissed our lives away? Because people aren't doing that, but I don't get it either. I don't get it. And, and, and you know, the, 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 the best thing, which I tell some of the cranks is it makes you feel better. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is totally, I, I've always said that to people about thank you notes. I said, send thank you notes. You'll love it. People will, res I had this, I wrote about that actually in my first book. And I had this guy who was a 3M vice president. His name was Tate Elder, who attended a seminar of mine years later. And he said that thank you note of your thing of yours, Tom. He said, I just retired. At my retirement party, a guy came up to me with tears almost in his eyes to thank me for a thank you note that I had sent him 12 years ago that he had had posted on his cubicle wall ever since. Wow. And, you know, on the one hand, holy moly. On the other hand, it really doesn't surprise me. Uh, you know, I think and you're, you're more of an expert on this than I am, I think we could fix an awful lot of it if we changed our hiring practices and if in particular, in particular, we changed our promotion practices. You know, my argument has been that the, the number one asset of any organization is the full collection of first line managers. And I don't give a damn whether it's General Motors or you're in my little restaurant with 14 employees. And so, so that, you know, some, I wish I could remember the name of the book. It wasn't one of yours. Fortunately, I wouldn't, I could never have forgotten it. Uh, it was an entire book about hiring and done well, you know, academic background, so on. And, and, and the point was hiring is the most important act in business and the one that is least understood. And really, the title, you know, the book was good, but the title just went bang and hit me right between the eyes. Hmm. Well, let's let's pick up on that thread for a second here, because you've brought up two things. And so the first part I wanted to come back to, Tom, was kind of back to in the book, you've got, uh, you know, 13 principles and themes. Number 12, which rang very dear to my heart because of a, a book I, I wrote called Lead Care Win is care. 
So is it that care, whether that's empathy or, you know, noticing that someone got a haircut or how their kids did on the weekend soccer matches or what have you, it, do we do we need to, you know, infuse our leaders with just a demonstration of what care is and how that can have such a demonstrable um, outcome and effect on how the employee feels when they're at work? You know the answer at least as well as I do. Yes. Next question. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how much of it is determined at birth. I don't know how much of it is determined by age 10 or 12. I, you know, there are certainly one thing that you know that I've focused on for the last 20 odd years or so is putting more women in charge. Uh, those tendencies tend to be more pronounced in women than they are in men. Uh, you know, it's really interesting, by the way, and I just read this in a, a wonderful, wonderful book. Find the authors, get them on, even if it's not directly related. It's called Compassionomics. Okay. And it is called The Role of Compassion in Healthcare. And by the way, it pays and makes people healthier. But in one of the things they said in Compassionomics that I love is that Charles Darwin never said survival of the fittest. To the contrary, he said survival of the most vital communities. It was not about individualism. It was about collectivism. And the most vital communities produce the most kids, have the most stability, and so on. And yet we bastardized it to, you know, whoever's the toughest son of a bitch is the one who wins. And I think that, you know, holds kind of in the competitiveness to get into the Harvard Business School, which is a very unfair thing to say, uh, and, and so on. But you know, yes, care, care, care and kindness. I, I even wrote this since I was trained as an engineer. I wrote an equation, and my equation was K equals R equals P, and it was kindness equals repeat business equals profit. And, uh, you know, I mean, the point of all this stuff that you, ca that you care about and I care about is it's a wonderful thing to do as a human being. It's you know going to be a lot better, make you a lot better off when you pass away, and the big guy is looking at your record. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also profitable. It's also profitable. It's you know, let's do it. You and I want to do it probably for altruistic reasons. But if you're the world's biggest son of a bitch, I'm telling you, if you're thoughtful to people, care for people, help them grow, you're going to have a bigger bank account, dude. <laughs> well, you, you bring up something that's interesting because you've connected, you know, the, the 12th theme of care to I think it's your third theme, which is uh, community and purpose. And so what I'm hearing you say, Tom, is that, you know, when you do care about the frontliner, when you care about the team member, when you're compassionate, when you employ empathy, you know, that's almost like step one. But you also have to look at the bigger picture, which is our earth, our community in which we serve. And if you bring to that game a game of purpose, then as you say in the book, quote, the business of business should not be just about money. It should be about responsibility. So tell me more about that line and the connection between community and a sense of purpose as a leader. Uh, well, to go back to what's become the theme of our conversation, I shouldn't have to. <laughs> to be as obvious as the end of your nose. Just let's end, let's end, let's end the end the interview. We'll we'll end the interview now, Tom, because we're like we're done, right? <laughs> we're done. We agree. Nothing. nothing. Um, yeah. But well. At one level, and I could obviously get off on this until hell froze over, in 1970, the Nobel laureate economist Milton Friedman wrote a famous article in the New York Times in which he said business had no, no social responsibility, quarterly shareholder maximization was the alpha, the omega, and everything in between. The, here, here, here's the quantitative implications of that. When Friedman wrote that in 1970, 50% of corporate profits went to shareholders, executives, and so on, and 50% went to the workforce, went to R&D, and so on. A study was done in 2014 by my old and now much diminished because of their bad behavior friends at McKinsey, <laughs> and 44 years later, the number was 90 frigging 1% 
of profits went to share buybacks, shareholders, and executive, and 9% went to workers R&D and so on. And that's a, that's a criminal act of the first order. And I think it's not unrelated to the troubles on the street that we see today because of the inequity that, that, has, that has arisen. Uh, I mean, the, the, other, the other part of it that, that, that I've said is, listen, uh, your workers, your workforce, your workers live somewhere. They're part of a community. The largest number of us during our waking hours, unless we were born rich, are going to be working in an organization. Right. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not that the organization should pay attention to the communities. It's the organization is the communities in which it works. It is the communities in which our vendors work. It is the communities in which our customers work. That's, that's our thing. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I think I used as an epigraph in my last book, something from the uh, Mihai Chick sent Mihai, the guy who wrote about flow. Yeah. And in it, he said, the purpose of business is, is to increase human well-being. And, you know, it, again, obvious is the end of your nose. And, and, but, but, but why, why are you and I doing such a shitty job? <laughs> no, I mean, why, why hasn't this obvious thing gotten through and again obvious in the mid to long term in terms of financial success as well you know i you know we talked a minute ago or so talk a little bit about hiring and so on one of the people who i quote is a guy who runs a biotech firm successfully and he said that the secret to our success and culture is that we only hire nice people and he said look this is biotech there are some degrees that you can't even pronounce because they're so complicated. But he said, what I discovered was even in that case, where it's something incredibly obscure, there are a lot of people who have the degrees, hire the nice ones. And, and here, here's the, this is the one I, I think I absolutely love most and it makes me weep when I say it. <laughs> a couple of folks whose names I can't remember wrote management lessons from the Mayo Clinic. And whenever they have those collective health care rankings that you see in the U.S., Mayo Clinic invariably comes out on top. So I'm in the business of hiring a neurosurgeon, and you are a neurosurgeon of some renown, uh, CV to die for, and I am interviewing you. Right. You don't know my little secret. My little secret, I don't know whether it's with a pen scratching on my hand or whatever it is, is that during the interview, I am counting the number of times that you use the word we mm. and the number of times that you use the word I. Now, that may sound like phony baloney. It isn't to them. If the, if the eyes beat the we, we's, Dr. Genius, you know, Good luck to you in your life, but you're not going to practice here. But, but, but the reason it's more than a wonderful habit is it goes all the way back to the original Dr. Mayo in 1914, who started the Mayo Clinic. And he said, what we want is team medicine. And mm -hmm. I know the Canadian healthcare system is a God bless you all, a lot <laughs> different than ours, but team medicine with MBAs running all the hospitals in the United States it ain't that by a long shot, but I just love that notion of, you know, it, it, so much of it is stand in the doorway and smile. Uh, how many times has he used the word or she used the word we versus I? These teeny weeny little things that just have enormous implications. Indeed, they do. Well, let's let's take one of those teeny little uh, indicators and extrapolate a little bit. Um, you've been such a proponent of investment in the organization by virtue of suggesting that training is actually an investment, not a cost. Now, Tom, as you know, I'm a very uh, long recovering chief learning officer and do indeed believe like you that we ought to be investing in our people. So where where does training sit with you and those investments? Like where are we making our bets, if you will, in our people? Is it helping them to care more? Is it about empathy and compassion? Is it teaching them that short-termism is a wrong thing to be thinking about? Like, where do we make our bets there, Tom? Well, 
I'm a little older than you are, he said with a smile. And so therefore I'm, I'm closer, closer to the pearly gates. And I, I one time I had this, I, had, I, used, I used a lot of PowerPoint slides in the oldie days. And I had one that was just a blank slide with a tombstone. And on the tombstone was written $23,726,289.12 net worth of the individual on the day the market closed, the day they died. And my comment to the audience was, ain't nobody ever had their net worth on their tombstone. That's <laughs> not what the evaluation process is all about. Right. And so I believe, and I'm hardly alone, that your record is a leader is the record of the success that the people who worked for you had. I had this wonderful thing happen. Um, I was giving a speech in Mumbai and sitting across from me, no more than that far, was a four-star general in uniform in the Indian Army. I think he even ran the Indian Army. And we got talking about some of this, oddly enough. And he said, okay, it comes down to Jane and Tom are my two finalist candidates for a promotion to general. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm only interested in one thing. He said, by hook and by crook, I will go back and I will find the people who worked for Jane and Tom and the degree to which they grew during the years they worked for him. That's the measure of Jane and Tom. Nothing else. I don't want to hear the PL or whatever the other readiness scores would be if you're talking about the army, but it's, you know, how did they do with developing people? And, you know, I, 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 don't, I loved it coming out of the mouth of a four-star general and one in India rather than, say, the United States or Canada. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and it's just, David Brooks, the New York Times columnist, wrote an article, and I put this, I think, near the end of my book, in which he contrasted what he called resume virtues and eulogy virtues. And mm -hmm. resume virtues, obviously the college you graduated from the 17 times that you were promoted, blah, 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 blah. The eulogy virtues are what do they say about you at your funeral? And that's all people stuff. And, you know, I don't think it's just... Uh, oh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm sitting here, not usual for me, at a loss for words. You know, you've asked all the right questions. You've hit every hot button that exists in my life. I don't know why we have to talk about this stuff. I don't know why it isn't obvious. Relative to training per se, the way that I have uh, put it together is I've said, A, it is capital investment, number one. As you said, it ain't a cost. It's the antithesis of a cost. Mm -hmm. That's the case. And number two, if you do not believe that training is of the utmost importance, then please do me a favor. Call a general, call an admiral, talk to the operations officer at a nuclear power plant, talk to a football coach or an archery coach, talk to a symphony conductor and ask them about training. That's what the F they do. Yeah. And why is it obvious for that symphony conductor and that football coach and that three star general in the army and two star admiral in the Navy and the guy who runs the nuclear power plant? Why? If, if I said to them, you know, training is really important, they would look at they would say, I hope I didn't pay you a consulting fee because that's the stupidest comment I've ever heard in my life. It's obvious, you idiot. Uh and, and, and so if it's so obvious in all those arenas, why the hell is it not obvious in my restaurant or in my, you know, software company or whatever else it is in between? Mm -hmm. it, reasons to stand. I think you're making the alignment that in some of those professions and, and categories and verticals, et cetera, they've looked at it as mission critical to use perhaps a term that might be applied, right? So maybe we need to get into these organizations and suggest, well, mission critical is actually the training of, of leaders and frontliners as to what, you know, a, a new era of business or organizational health actually is. It is care. It is purpose. It is community. It is kindness. It's your, it's your engineering equation from a few moons ago. We agree? Yeah. 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 I, I, it's, 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 it's absolutely, you know, it's absolutely the case. Uh, 
And I, and, I, and I don't know why you and I have done such a shitty job. <laughs> As I said earlier, it doesn't take a high IQ. It doesn't take a graduation <laughs> certificate from the fifth grade, let alone, you know, only the third. Uh, this is just, uh, I think this is just a commiseration between the two of us, Tom, about how awful the job we've been doing for years. So I think Misery Loves Company. That's the name of this podcast is Misery Loves Company. That's what we're going to do here, Mr. Peter. <laughs> I, but, I, I, think, I think you're right. Uh, I have, uh, I've got two more questions for you. And there are two topics that I know you hold near and dear to your heart. The first, you've already, well, you brought up both, but I want to ask questions about each of these two uh, genres, if you will. And so women. So you've been... Uh, the hugest and the strongest of allies, like your hair on fire, forced to be reckoned with, um, leader from the from Twitter, from speeches, from your writing, from everywhere of what we need to be doing to promote, to sustain, to elevate women. So it's not a question of why. That's that's um, repugnant a uh, question to ask you, but. Where do you see it going well? It doesn't have to be the individual or, or organization that's doing it, but what are some of the things you're noticing that where we have made some progress? Well, I think, I think we have. Totally inadequate, arguably, uh, but the percentage of women on boards is going up. Uh, my, again, old friends at McKinsey did a study five or six years ago and companies that had more women on their boards performed financially exceptionally better than the rest over time. So mm -hmm. there, there is, there, there is, there is, there's significant movement for God's sakes. If you're, if you're my age, it's a lot different than it was 20 or 25 years ago. Uh, my argument is that the research is clean, clear, and there's plenty of it that says women are better leaders. I'm always careful when I say this because the answer is there are shitty women leaders and there are fantastic male leaders, but on that bell-shaped curve, yeah. on average, women are better than men at the leadership job. And a lot of it is that they listen more. They do tend to care more. You know, there's a wonderful book written by a, a UCSF neuroscientist. Her name is Luann Brizendine. The book was called The Female Brain. And there were a lot of things in it that I found interesting, but the one that kind of interested me or amused me or whatever most was that by the age of three days, three days after coming out of the womb, the baby girl is making four times more eye contact with her fellow human being wow. than the boy is. So this focus on relationships and so on you know, really, really comes out of the birth canal, if you mm. will. Uh, and so, I mean, the, the, the evidence is there that more women in charge means more effectiveness in the organization. And it's, again, like so many of these things, it seems to me to be the ultimate no-brainer. And, and, and we're, we are making progress. Totally inadequate, not totally inadequate. In many cases, it's better than it was. I mean, I went to the Stanford Business School class of 72, and we had 307 people who matriculated, four of whom were women. Uh, we've come a long way on that kind of a dimension, but we also have a long way to go. Okay, um, and I agree wholeheartedly. My last uh, question before we find out more about you, and if there is anything more to find out about you, by the way, is you've been also a very staunch ally of, as you mentioned earlier uh, today, the frontline team member. Now, when I'm working with organizations and, you know, I, I it may be disrespectful, but what I try to provide is a bit of an analogy on what leaders are not doing, particularly in the senior le level uh, roles. And I often say that, Tom, the frontline team member is the soldier often left behind enemy lines. And it sort of gives them this very stark impression of OMG, he's kind of right. What the hell are we doing forgetting about the frontline team members? Like we need to be making more of an investment, back to your words, in these people. So it's not about the comment on the line, Tom. It's why are you in agreement of, of supporting frontline team members? And again, back to kind of the, the women comment, are, are we making progress? Do you see something happening there in sort of your purview? Well, 
first of all, and I should have said this before, the management guru class of which I am guilty significantly tends to focus on the Fortune 500 and the FTSE 100. In the United States, the Fortune 500 actually only employs 7% of us. 93% are not part of that. And so when we talk about any of these topics, the, the wonderful news is the SMEs, the small and the medium-sized enterprises are loaded with hundreds and thousands of organizations that do do this stuff right. and who do it well. And, you know, they, they are the great salvation. I think certainly in the United States and I think everywhere, the SMEs create well over 100% of new jobs in the United States, which is to say the big dudes are losing them and the small and mediums make up, you know, make up the balance. Uh, and so I'm, I'm in, encouraged that people do get it. I don't know whether a larger number of SMEs are getting it than they, than they did in the past. The giant companies, in a way, are becoming less relevant than they were in the past. They are not the drivers, particularly with lots of, of new industries. Uh, and, you know, it all, I had one day in my adult professional life that stands above all the others. And that was the day doing the research for what eventually became In Search of Excellence, when my co -auth, subsequent co-author, Bob Waterman, and I went down the road from our McKinsey San Francisco office, 30 miles to Palo Alto, and had an interview with the president of the Hewlett Packard Company, which was not a behemoth bureaucracy like it is today. I think it was around the billion dollar mark, but it was still manageable. And during the interview with the president, he introduced us to the four most important letters in my life. MBWA, managing <laughs> by wandering around. And MBWA means what it says, and it can be also done in the world of Zooming, incidentally. That's, a, that's another discussion. But here's what it did for me. And I was, you know, I'm a guy with two engineering degrees and two business degrees, for God's sakes. What it did for me is that it said, Leadership is, and my, I'm choosing my words incredibly carefully, leadership is an intimate act. It is an intimate act. It is the genuine conversation between me, the 51-year-old John Young, who is president, and you, the 26-year-old engineer who got out of Stanford or MIT only a couple of years ago. It is a real human interaction between the two of us in which we are both interested in what we're doing and each other and so on. But the, the MBWA day, it just it blew my it blew my world up. And, you know, I subsequently wrote something which actually came to me bizarrely enough while walking on the beach in New Zealand. Uh, if MB, if you don't have fun doing MBWA, then do the world a fee favor, go home and resign your job as a leader. It's uh, it, it, it should be fun in the best sense of that word to, you know, to inter to interact with one's I, I just one, one other one. I know, you know, I know I do this quote thing too much, but I'm really pissed off at myself because I forgot to put this quote in my latest book, which is very compact. There was a tough, old, brutal son of a bitch who was a National Football League coach by the name of Vince Lombardi who won championship after championship. This is the Lombardi line. And I want all of our listeners and viewers to listen to this. He said, I do not have to like my players, but I must love them. Uh -huh. I must care about them and care for them. You know, maybe you annoy the hell out of me on many dimensions, but down deep, I've got and, and, I, and I, I love the quote in general, but it would be one thing coming out of somebody's mouth, but Lombardi, you know, and then he went through the whole list of love is leadership, love is loyalty, love is what have you. And words like kindness, words like caring, words like love uh, need, need to be in the vocabulary a lot more than they are today. Tom, I got to tell you, uh, confession to make, I like and love you. Uh, you've uh, always been in search of excellence, but you are excellence. And here's a little confession of mine. 
Um, every time I write a book, I think about what would Tom Peters say? What would Tom Peters say about the book title? And so when I often am writing, because you and I are masochists, we just write till uh, someone tells us we shouldn't anymore. Um, I'm thinking about words like flat and purpose and open and care and my latest one coming out, work-life bloom. So I just wanted to tip my hat like uh, for all of us that have been living in your, not just vapor trails, but the path you have carved for people who are trying to help those organizations and leaders and frontline team members, you know, live both and work a better life. So with that, where can we find more out about the illustrious Tom Peters? <laughs> uh, do it the easy way. TomPeters.com has got everything that I have published in every interview I've given for about the last 20 years. So that's not a bad starting point. Well, the uh, honor, both H-O-N-O-R and H-O-N-O-U-R of mine was uh, conducting this, Tom. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to doing this once again. Everyone, Tom Peters, the legend. Uh, this has been another episode of Leadership Now. Thanks for listening.